Next up, we have, is this working? No. Tanya Bruguera, Murad Owade, and Felipe Be Beza talking about art util, the idea of art as utility, as useful, as something that we can use in our day-to-day -day living and actually invoke change. In this case, particularly change in relationship to communities at risk and migrant communities in particular. Um, please help me in welcoming Tanya, Murad, and Felipe. Good evening, everyone. How are, you, how are you guys enjoying the Brooklyn Conference so far? Awesome. So I'm a Brooklyn native, and in Brooklyn we're louder than that, and I'm assuming most of you are too. So how are you enjoying the Brooklyn Conference so far? <laughs> so my name is Murad Awada. I am the Vice President of Advocacy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Uh, we're an organization that brings together and convenes immigrant-serving and immigrant-led organizations across the state of New York. Uh, we have over 200 members in our great state. Uh, we are the largest immigrant rights coalition in the nation. Um, and as you may have noticed... <laughs> Come on, this is, this is very good. <laughs> as you may have noticed, we've been slightly busy this year. Um, <laughs> And one thing that has been ever apparent to me is that we will continue to be busy. Um, and we don't see any relief in sight until we unite as a people um, and actually fight the good fight all together. So our conversation here today is more so, it's not gonna be really moderated, um, <laughs> but it's a conversation around how we can come together you, using art as a, a tool in our form of resistance. And resistance may mean something else to someone else, but at the end of the day, it's about fighting back. Um, so with that, I'd like to just contextualize the work that we've been doing uh, very quickly. Uh, from the second that our current president was elected, uh, we organized mass mobilizations across New York um, and started to fight back against his anti-immigrant uh, agenda. Uh, shortly after signing the Muslim ban um, this past January, we mobilized thousands of people to JFK Airport and fought back and brought out <laughs> and brought out over a thousand lawyers who provided free legal services to hundreds of people from over 20 Muslim majority countries. So when we're talking about how do you use your tool and your skill as an as a, um, act of resistance, lawyers use their act of resistance at that moment. Their skills were their act of resistance. And having them stationed in the airport for nine whole days was really amazing to see the might of people coming together. Um, you know, we were successful in fighting it back the first time, the second time, and the third time. And we'll continue to be successful only because <laughs> it is wrong. And at the end of the day, what is wrong will always fail. And I want, you know, it may seem like a very simple thing. What's wrong will fail. But we need to keep reminding ourselves that because there's a confusion about what's wrong and what's right. Um, currently, we're fighting against uh, Trump's anti-dreamer uh, agenda right now, and he rescinded DAC on September 5th, and on March 5th, every single day after March 5th, 1,100 DREAMers will lose their protected status. It's not even a status, it's a, a category, which means that they won't even, they won't be a target for deportation. Um, and to be that heartless is beyond me, right? So we're talking about how do we stand up and fight back? And how do we use the tools that you all come together with in doing that? Um, so I'm gonna kick it off to Tanya, who's gonna start talking about her view of what's happening. I think you summarized it really well. And uh, <laughs> being an artist next to you is very humbling. Uh, but um, I think as an artist, which is the terrain we, we have to act, um, I feel that uh, we are equipped to, to understand systems. And we are also equipped to understand relationships that are not evident, but also we are equipped to 
enact before things pardon, enact before things happen the future that we want. And I think we, ha we can create a spaces where we can invite others to leave the moment that is not there yet, but we know it's going to come. And I think this is something that uh, we can do, but also um, as an artist advocating for art as a tool, I also want to recommend uh, some strategies that we use sometime in the Arte Util group, which is uh, to be alegal. And alegal is a, is a Spanish word. Get used to it, you should have more foreigner words in your mm -hmm. art vocabulary. Um, and alegal means something that the law has not yet conceived. So I think that's something the artist can do. The artist can imagine not only loophole, but even things that the people who are regulating our life now have not even conceived yet. And those are the spaces in which we can enter and gain some terrain. Another thing that we can do is um, trying to understand the spaces of ignorance of the people who are in power right now. These are also places that we can occupy um, by making sure that the language is not being reduced to good and bad, tremendous and horrible, but making sure that we defend the right for complexity uh, through the work we do. And, um, and the other thing in terms of immigration, and I'm saying this in guilt, in a way, I think the moment to, I think immigrants don't want to be represented. So I stop representing immigrants. Immigrants want the rights. And how can we give the rights or help them to advance in the rights through art? It's not by, we need to hear stories, and the stories are very important, but I think we know what is going on. We don't need another person telling us what's going to happen with their life. We need our artistic institutions to step in and start defending immigrants. And I want to propose something, which is something I've been working on, is trying to see if museums, foundations, there are specific museums since we are in one, can become sanctuary for immigrants. I know when the people say sanctuary, people freaked out because the image is like people living in the museum, how are we going to feed them, the bathroom. <laughs> what we're saying is, a commitment by the museum to not collaborate with ICE, but also a commitment of the museums to, in their demographic, African-American, gay, woman, to put undocumented artists. We need to start adding to those uh, statistics how many undocumented artists are in your shows. That's my question. <laughs> Yeah, well, as, as an artist, I think it's, I've always battled that, you know, um, how to use my art or my practice as a tool. And we had talked earlier that I have done both, done, I mean, I don't call myself an activist, but I've put my body on the line, you know. Um, I've put myself in deportation in order to, like, find cases within detention centers. And that's how I feel. I mean, I feel like through art, yeah, there's a point that it could cultivate a conversation which is, has been happening lately a lot. Uh, I'm in a graduate program right now, and there's a lot of teaching that I'm doing. Uh, and it's also like shocking to know that a lot of people don't know what undocumented people could do and cannot do. Like, they thought I voted, <laughs> which a lot of people think a lot of undocumented people voted. Um, but I want to thank you both. And obviously, I, I was telling Tanya that I usually say no to these kind of panels because there's no specific agenda of like, tell your story, like the poor narrative of like poor immigrant. Um, and obviously the story's already out there and we know already, you don't need to know that, you know, it's like, I don't want to romanticize being undocumented, but you know, like we learn to, we learn to survive under these circumstances, you know, and I learned that from my parents, like how to navigate systems, you know, like when we're sick, how do you like get healthy, like some kind of care. Uh, and I've done that, you know, I've gone through where I am now, not because the resources have been there, but I've been like, finding my way through those resources and getting them, um, but also with my community in a sense. Um, but I also, a good point that I also wanted to uh, point out is that I'm glad I'm in the panel and I'm having a documented voice on the panel because in a lot of situations we have people who are not embodying those experiences talk on behalf of us 
Um, so that's a bit tricky. Um, but I do agree with you that institutions should be daring um, and basically help out or invest in immigrant artists and undocumented artists. How can we help out? I think a lot of it is that we actually don't have a lot of resources and a lot of resources that are out there are for citizens basically. So it's like how to, I mean, through my application process for graduate school, like I knew I was gonna have a comeback, like how do I navigate that, you know? But it's also more like, no, I belong here. Like I have a right to be here. Like I'm not taking someone's space because I, I belong in that spot. You know, I got the spot because I deserve it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a back and forth between my work and obviously like that's what I do with my own work, but also there's an, also a limit to what I can do with my work. So it's like putting my body on the line. And I mean, obviously I have nothing to lose, you know, like I, I'm not doing this for myself, but for my parents, you know, who ultimately like if, if DACA does happen and something gets actually worked out, a lot of people are gonna be thrown under the bus. And those are my parents, you know, uh, but that's, but that goes into this like good immigrant, bad immigrant narrative that happens within <coughs> undocumented communities about, I have the right to be here because I, you know, I went to school, I did this, and I was never arrested, you know, so it's just like, um, I don't know, it's, it's very, it's, very, it's a very dark time, you know, it's like, I don't want to also romanticize that, oh, it's, oh, it's awesome being undocumented, you know, but, but you learn to sort of cope with it, you learn to, you know, I, I think for me an eye-opener was when I went to Alabama, and it's like, why would you stay here, you know, but it's like, they learn to cope with that situation, they learn to survive and navigate that system which I could not do, you know, like my fear for me means very different from my fear for someone, I mean, in Buffalo, New York, we were just talking about that. Mm. Um, so, yeah. One aspect that I think that we actually have been trying to battle back is the good immigrant, bad immigrant narrative. Um, and when we're looking at immigration as a whole, we have 11 million people in the United States who are undocumented, of which, recently um when daca was rescinded people who were going to be impacted and who took it who actually applied for daca was about eight hundred thousand people then you have temporary protected status which is a status that is given to people who are undocumented in the united states who come from countries uh where there's natural disaster or conflict and folks who have TPS amount to about 400, 450,000 people in the US. So when we're talking about these different categories of folks who have some sort of status, um, we tend to forget that the vast majority of people who are undocumented in the US don't have a pathway to getting any form of status. Um, so my aspect of like coming to this work is like I come from a Palestinian family, my parents, uh, came to the US, had no supportive services, na had to navigate a system, and learned how to navigate the system um, on their own. And when they did that, it instilled some like a, a form of adaptability in us. And it was something that's very unique to the immigrant experience in the US. And I think that it is, it comes with the first generation uh, folks who actually see and have to play that translator role, the person who fills out the forms for their parents' health insurance, and all these different like little tidbits that folks, like my son would never have to do that for me, right? But we had to assume that role for our family. Um, and that's an experience that I'm kind of like upset he won't have to do because, not that I want him to do it because I did it, but I think that it taught me so much um, about systems in itself. And one aspect that uh, I think we are trying, all three of us to say is, how can artists and folks in the art world, and I'm sorry about the echo, I'm not sure why that's happening, um, can actually, what can you do to show up? And Tanya told us, museums need to start thinking about how they can become sanctuaries. Not working with federal immigration authorities to put people first before your spaces, and that may be uncomfortable. And that's fine, because we're living in very uncomfortable times. So if you are comfortable right now, you shouldn't be. It's okay. <laughs> um, and the other piece is making a real diligent effort to make sure you're reaching out and lifting up undocumented voices. So I'm not here to talk to you because I am not undocumented, and I don't know that lived experience. 
I am the child of immigrants in this country. Um, and I don't want to speak for anyone but myself. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes when allies come into the space, it seems as if they are taking on the role or the experience of the other person. And that's not really the role of an ally. Um, allyship to me means showing up. You can retweet, you can like, you can you know, share a Facebook post. That's not showing up. Um, if, you're, if that's your form of resistance, I'm going to res respectfully decline your allyship. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we need people to show up. Yeah. You, the power in the people is real. So showing up and putting your bodies on the line is a real big ask. But that is the ask that we're making of you today. And looking at the bigger picture. So if I were to get arrested, I'd end up getting put through processing, get a desk appearance ticket, and have to show up if I did civil disobedience and block traffic. Um, someone who is someone who has status or someone who doesn't have status, that is not their case, right? So they are literally putting their lives on the line when they take that small step of civil disobedience. So we have more people who are our allies who should be stepping up and doing that and thinking about different ways that you can contribute to the resistance. So how are you using your art mm -hmm. to look at the, the big picture and look at the macro view of what's happening? And how do you educate other people in your field? How do you educate folks who don't look like or are immigrants? Um, and how does that work? And I don't have a solution to that because I'm not an artist. I know you all are and can figure it out. Um, so I wrote I on my hand. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, what are other things that people can do right now to try to elevate and lift up uh, yeah. immigrants, documented or undocumented? And I'm talking from a documented point of view. Um, temporary, because I have to renew my green card. So we'll see. Uh, but I think from the art um, point of view, let's say translating what you just said, maybe for art context, the way I see it is to give away your space for others. You should never speak for them. Just give them your privilege. Share the privilege with them. Um, for example, um, make sure that when you are invited to a project, I recently was invited to a project say, oh, and an immigrant group is going to sew it. And, and I was immediately like red flags. And I say, I want to talk to the people in the group. I went to a lawyer and say, I want an amendment to my contract that say that these immigrants are going to be paid the same the artists are being paid. And this is the kind of concrete actions we need to do. When you're going to talk about immigration, make sure that the person next to you is the person who has the experience. And he's talking for himself, not you talking for them. So I think we can do a lot. Um, for example, in, in San Francisco, we just did an event with the cultural strike where we did the whole day for undocumented artists to have the chance to talk to curators. Curators who would never go to their studios, curators who don't care about undocumented immigrants who are artists. And we made sure that that day, these artists had the chance to show their work to these professionals so they are actually available on their landscape of potential people for shows, you know? So I think we can do a lot with very little, you know? And we are all fucked up. So <laughs> don't worry, you know? <laughs> and yeah, the other, the other thing I think we have to do is to, I'm very nervous because I see a tendency to personalize the problem with the abuser in chief the racist in chief. And I think we need to understand that as a system. And as artists, we can crack the system. So let's try to crack the system instead of complaining about the raper in chief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll be talking from an undocumented point of view. <laughs> I think what could be done directly is investing in, in, in the work of undocumented migrant artists. Um, and not just me, but if you want to know, there's a bunch of lists that are, they're, I mean, they're out there. Um, 
and given us access to residencies, you know, if, if anybody here is part of a residency program, like giving access to that or making a fellowship for undocumented artists. Um, and obviously letting us be at the forefront, you know, I feel like there are a lot of artists who work around these issues or not, and are not directly being impacted. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Um, but I think directly what, what an institution could do is invest in those artists. And I think that's what we need. But also I think there's a sort of speculation of what an undocumented art looks like. And that's what I'm having right now during my program and where I'm not meeting those sort of like, <laughs> you know, um, and that's like another conversation. But, um, but yeah, just giving us a space, you know, not just showcase, but, but to make. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my last point is that this, this this event, this panel shouldn't just be like a one intersectional event, mm -hmm. you know, that there should be something happening after this, you know, that we maintain in touch and work with, obviously we are somehow connected in, in the work we do, but also keeping on going that conversation, because I feel like in the panels where I've been going, like there's lots of touch and nothing happens and it's just for the event. And so that's why I stopped saying no, but I now said yes, <laughs> uh, because I was interested in having this kind of conversation of what can we do instead of like sharing my immigrant story in a sense. And I think we are getting down to the nitty gritty on our time frame. Um, so just with the show of, hand, Shan, yeah, show of hands, how many folks have actually participated in some form of protest in the past 10 months? Yeah. Okay, so it's like almost the entire room. Mm -hmm. How many folks have like tried to figure out how to donate and support and lift uh, immigrant organizations with a show of hands. Not that I'm trying to shame anyone. <laughs> okay. So, how many people actually try to get some of their family and friends to do the same? Okay. We can do better. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, we can do so much ourselves, but we need to make sure that we're actually engaging our communities. Um, and from what we s saw in the past election, you know, I'm not going to talk about too many of the specifics of what actually occurred on election day um, or who voted for who, but we've seen a huge, huge reemergence of white supremacy in the United States. And for our folks in the audience, I think that it's incumbent on folks to challenge that. And white supremacy comes in a whole bunch of different forms, which I don't think we have enough time to talk about right now. But we do have a commander in chief who is a white supremacist at the end of the day. Because I've never heard or seen a Nazi who is a good person. Um, because, you know, uh, yeah. So I think the, the point that I'm trying to make is that you all have a role to play. Hmm. And it's if you choose to take up that role and do it. So there's a number of different things that you heard, and I'm just going to try to quickly summarize it. A, contact your museums, the places you visit, your art centers. If you're a curator, invest in immigrant communities. Invest in providing and lifting up immigrant artists. That is something that is extremely critical. Look at how you can turn your spaces into sanctuary spaces. And I think that that's something I've actually, and I've do immigration work and I've not heard anyone say a museum as a sanctuary space, but I think that that's an amazing idea. And the things about where people are gonna use the bathroom and like sleep, those things can get figured out because when it comes down to life and death, I'd wanna help the person live. Um, and in most chances when people are getting detained and deported, they're being deported back to their death. So, and that's not me just being hyperbole, it's like the reality that we're living in right now. Um, so you have like less than a minute. If you guys want to end on any uplifting words, since that was just really depressing. <laughs> Mine is not very uplifting, very uh, No, I just want to make sure that everybody can check with themselves how you contribute with racism and discrimination to undocumented artists. Um, even using categories like aesthetic, uh, you know, uh, you know, quality of the work, and uh, we need to open up our aesthetic di di uh, di um, yeah, song, yeah? Um, to include things that we don't understand, to include things that we are not sure what it is yet. We don't need to always put in our spectrum of good aesthetics 
the things that have been already proven by Europe 300 years ago or 500 years. Like we need to be, uh, we don't need to wait 60 years to understand that the work that some people are doing today is good. Now is when you need to support that project, those projects. Yeah. And <laughs> but I think also besides investing in, in undocumented artists, I think well, there's a lot of talks in today and sitting at the table, you know, like having yes. that seat at the table, you know, not just the seat at the table, but being also part of the, you know, the curators in the museum, uh, being also the institutions, faculty, you know, if, if it brings different, it changes a lot, you know, I feel also besides the investment in financial towards undocumented artists, but also showcasing, you know, I feel that needs to happen. Yeah. But we should also be included in many different conversations. One little thing. Yeah. Um, I remember that a few years ago, like four years ago, we invited an artist to a show we were doing because having the name of that museum in his curriculum make him available for all one visa. So you have power, you can make things change, you know. And unfortunately, at this point, we're out of time. Zero. But I want to <laughs> echo something that Felipe said two seconds ago. And we're not talking about just having one seat at the table. We need a few seats at the table. So just being cognizant of your privilege at that moment to make sure that you are being inclusive in your actions and not just in your words um, is critically important. And with that, I want to thank you all for coming out today. And continue to fight and continue to stand up because at the end of the day, I really do believe that we are going to win because if we fight, we will win. So thank you all. Thanks. Enjoy the conference.